السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا زاد المستقنع of Imam Al-Hajjawi he says فصل section this section is pertaining to the burial rites actually sorry how to pray over the dead this section is pertaining to the prayer over the dead person so the first statement the author says in this fossil, in this section, he says قوله السنة أن يقوم الإمام عند صدره The sunnah is that the imam, as well as the munfarid, they stand at the chest of the male person. They stand at the chest area of the male person, the upper chest. الرواية الثانية أن أحمد أن يقف عند رأس الرجل وصبي كذلك Another رواية, which is held by Ibn Qudama in the madhab, is that the man is stood at at the head as well as the child the male child so the author's opinion is that you stand at the chest and another riwayah another opinion in the madhab is that you stand um, at the head of the man as well as the male child in Bukhari and Muslim it mentions what the author says pertaining to the woman which is in the wastiha pertaining to the woman the imam he stands at the middle of the woman because in Bukhari Muslim, we have the hadith of Sumra ibn Jundub radiallahu anhu, where he said, Salaitu khalfa al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, fasalla ala ummi ka'bin matat fi nifasiha, faqama in the wastiha. So this companion radiallahu anhu, Sumra ibn Jundub, as in Bukhari Muslim, he said, I prayed behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who prayed upon Umm Ka'b, who had died whilst she was in her nifas, state of nifas. So the Prophet وسلم, stood at the middle of her body. So for the woman, the standing with the Imam is at the middle of the body. من وقوف الإمام عند وسط المرأة and the wisdom from that لأن وسط المرأة محل عجزها وفرجها فكان الإمام يحول بين المعمومين والنظر إليها فيسطرها. The hikma is that the Imam he stands at the wasp, the middle of the woman, because that's where her private part is. So the woman, as she's protected, her honor is protected in life, her own honor is also protected in death. So the Imam, he acts as a barrier between her private area and the ma'mumin who are standing behind the Imam. Okay, so this is something which is recommended. Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman, in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni, he says that the standing of the Imam in these positions, whether it be at the head, of the man, whether it be at the chest of the man, whether it be at the middle for the woman, all of this is something which is mustahab. So wherever the man, the imam, he stands, then it's going to be mujze, then the salah will be valid. But these are things which are recommended and mustahab. Tayyib. There's some masail, some issues that we need to mention here. First of them, who is the most deserving to lead the prayer? Who is the most deserving to lead the janaza salah upon the dead? The most deserving to lead the prayer in the madhab is the one that which is mentioned in the wasiyah. As this is how many of the companions like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhumah and uh, Umar radiallahu anhu had uh, their salah done. So Abu Bakr, he had Umar pray over him radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu had Suhaib radiallahu anhu pray over him. So they left it in their wills, in the wasiyah that such and such a person will pray over them. And this is how the companions, radiallahu anhum, used to do it, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al matiri and others. So this is the most deserving to lead in the salah. With regards to the, um, the prayer itself, it's sunnah to pray in jama'ah, okay? It's sunnah to have the salah done in jama'ah, however, it's not wajib. And this is mentioned in Rawd al-Murbi' and a famous explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni. Also another mas'ala, the third mas'ala, that it's a sunnah to have three rows as a minimum, minimum when the salah is being performed. So you may have, for example, six people attending. Rather than having those six people in one row, those six people, it's recommended highly that they divide it into three rows. Why? Because we have in the books of the sunnah, and Imam Tirmidhi said the hadith is hasan, as, is, as did Imam Nawawi in Al-Majmu, uh, mentioned by Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman in his explanation. The following hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مِنْ مَيِّتٍ يَمُوتُ فَيَقُومُ عَلَيْهِ ثَلَاثَةُ صُفُوفِ إِلَّا وَجِبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ That there is no dead person whom three rows stand upon him, except that Jannah is going to be obligatory for him. So based upon this hadith and other textual evidences, it's recommended that there are three rows as a minimum, uh, praying over the dead if that is able to be done. Uh, the next mas'ala, if there's more than one janazah, 
to be prayed in one time is better to have them all together to pray them all together as this is how the Salaf radiallahu anhum would do it they wouldn't divide up the salawat rather they would pray all of the, the salat al janaza upon all the dead that were there in one go and it's in keeping with the sunnah where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said asri'u bil janazati that be quick with regards to the prayer over the dead person um, also the last mas'ala at this point is that the janaza is not to be prayed the salah in the madhab is not to be prayed in the short in the three short forbidden times the first of them which is after sunrise until the sun has risen above the horizon a spear's length and the second of the forbidden times is when the sun is in its meridian in the middle of the sky it stops there for around three to five minutes and also the third is when the sun is on its way to setting in these times the madhab holds that the salat al janaza should not be prayed uh, another riwayah, a second riwayah, a second opinion in the madhab held by Ibn Taymiyyah and others is that it is allowed in these times, that even in the forbidden short times that the Salat al-Janazah is permitted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The author, he says in his next sentence, he says قوله ويكبروا أربعان that the Imam, when he's going to pray over the dead, that he should make four takbirat four takbirat. It's mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu who said an the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam na'a ala al-najasi fi al-yawm al-lazhi mata fihi fa kharaja ila al-musalla fa saffa bihim wa kabbara arba'an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day that it was announced that Najashi uh, had passed away radiyallahu anhu had passed away then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he went out to the musalla and he got the people into rows and he made four takbirat so this is an evidence that four takbirat should be made by the Imam. Sheikh Abdul Salam uh, al Shawair, he says that, um, and he's one of the leading Hanbali scholars uh, alive today, he said that more than four takbirat can be done up to seven. Okay, it can be five, it can be six, it can be seven. Uh, this is another riwayah in the madhab. The significance of this tak takbirat, a takbirat al arba'a kullaha ar arkan, taqumu maqam al raka'at al arba'a fi salah, that these four takbirat. They are arkan in the salah, they are rukan in the salah, and they take the place of the four raka'at which would be prayed in a four raka'at salah. Okay, so these four uh, takbirat they are like raka'at, they should not be missed, they, they cannot be missed. The author says, uh, In the first takbir, after the raising of the hands of the first takbir. Then after seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Fatiha must be read. Okay, Surah Al-Fatiha is a rukun as we will come to know. But seeking the ta'awwud, seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and saying the basmalah, bismillah rahman rahim these two are mustahab. Okay, question to yourselves, if anyone's there, why is there no dua al-istiftah? Why is there no dua al-istiftah? Why is there no opening dua at this juncture of the salah? طيب the ulama they say لأن هذه صلاة مبناها على تخفيف because this salah its foundation is that it's built upon ease and, sim and, and quickness okay so therefore there's not going to be any recitation of any surah or dual istifta nor is there going to be a ruku or, or sujood etc the, uh, the salah is built upon تخفيف built upon ease and quickness um, a second riwayah in the madhab held by the great imam Abu Bakr al-Khilal Rahimullah Ta'ala, who was one of the founding members of the Madhab uh, of the third century, he, sell, he used to hold or he held that it's, uh, the recitation of the Dua al istiftah is legislated, as mentioned by Sheikh uh, Sami ibn Abdurrahman. The author he says, وَيُصَلِّي عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي الثَّانِيَةِ كَالتَّشَهُّدِ That in the, after the second takbir, that the Imam he makes salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it would be made in the tashahud. Uh, the Imams al Razak and Imam Nisa'i they collect the following hadith which was authenticated by Ibn Hajr al Asqalani rahimahullah ta'ala in Fath al Bari who said the hadith is uh, sahih. Abi Umama radiallahu anhu he said a sunnah fi salah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a sunnah fi salat al janaza and you kabir. ثم يقرا بأم القرآن ثم يصلي على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم يخلص الدعاء للميت ولا يقرا الا في الاولى 
that this companion, he said that the sunnah in the salah, so the Prophet ﷺ didn't say this, this is the statement of the companion, that the sunnah in the salat al janaza is that you made the takbir and then you recite uh, Surah Al-Fatiha and then you send salah upon Nabi Wasallam, and then you make a sincere dua for the dead in the third and the recitation is not done except in the first raka'ah. So this is from the proofs that salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is to be made after the second takbir. The author, he says, وَيَدْعُ فِي الثَّالِثَةِ That dua for the dead is to be made after the third takbir. So we have in the hadith of Abi Dawood and Imam Ibn Hibban, rahimahumullah uh, ta'ala, a proof which shows the importance of this main objective of the salah. So the main objective of the salat al janaza is to make dua for the dead as a way of making intercession for him. The Prophet وسلم, said, إِذَا صَلَيْتُمْ عَلَى الْمَيِّتْ فَأَخْلِصُوا لَهُ الدُّعَى If you make, if you have prayed or if you pray upon the dead person, then strive in making a sincere dua for the dead person. So this is something which is imperative and it's the crux of the matter when it comes to uh, praying over the dead person. That salah uh, must involve sincere dua. That sincere dua should be made for the dead person. طيب, looking at the dua now, the different parts of the dua. Uh, the first part of the dua is collected by Imam Ahmad, Abi Dawood, and Tirmidhi. Okay. However, there is something which is not found uh, authentically in these ahadith. Uh, these are lafdatay, the two statements which I'm going to mention now. Where in the dua it says, "Wa anta ala kulli shayin qadir." This is not authentic. Nor is the word was sunnah. Okay. Where did these come from? Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi rahimahullah ta'ala He put this in the text of al-Muqna' and Imam al-Hajjawi copied him from that in the text of Az-Zad. So these two uh, phrases, wa anta ala kulli shayin qadir and the word as sunnah is not from this hadith which was mentioned or collected by Ahmad, Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi. Uh, may Allah have mercy upon them all. So the first part of the dua فيقول اللهم اغفر لحينا وميتنا وشاهدنا وغائبنا وصغيرنا وكبيرنا وذكرنا وأنثانا إنك تعلم من قلبنا ومثوانا وأنت على كل شيء قدير اللهم من أحييته منا فأحييه على الإسلام والسنة ومن توفيته منا فتوفه عليهما طيب the second part of the dua, which we're going to mention now, is found in the book of Sahih Muslim, narrated or collected by Imam Muslim, where the dua is to be made as followed. Allahumma aghfir lahu warhamhu, wa'afihi wa'fu anhu, wa'akrim nuzalahu, wa'awsa' mudkhalahu, wa'gsilhu bil ma'i wa thalji wal barad, wa naqqihi min al-dhunubi wal khatayaya, kama yunaqqal thawbu al-abiyadu min al-danasi, وأبدله دارا خيرا من داره وزوج خير من زوجه وأدخله الجنة وعذه من عذاب القبر وعذاب النار. Okay, the companion who narrated this hadith, uh, Awf ibn Malik, uh, when he heard this, he said, تمنيت أن أكون أن ذلك الميت. He said, I wished that I was the dead person that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was saying these amazing words over. And of course, I didn't translate or explain the meanings of this dua, but it's found in the text which is on the fiqh group. The next part of the dua, which is also in Sahih Muslim, the, uh, the reciter, the Imam, he would say, وَأَفْسِحْ لَهُ فِي قَبْرِهِ وَنَوِّرْ لَهُ فِيهِ Okay? And the last part of the dua, which is not authentically found in the uh, ahadith, however, many of the fuqaha, they recommended that it be said, uh, from them was Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala from the Imams of the Tabi'een. Uh, if, the, if the dua is for a young, then the following is said, وَإِنْ كَانَ صَغِيرًا قَالْ If it's for a young, he says, اللهم اجعل له ذكرا لوالديه وفرطا وأجرا وشفيئا مجابا اللهم ثقل به موازينهما وَعَظِمْ بِهِ أُجُورَهُمَا وَأَلْحِقْهُ بِصَالِهِ صَلِفِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَاجْعَلْهُ فِي كَفَالَةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ وَقِهِ بِرَحْمَتِكَ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ Question to yourselves, why is a dua made for the parents here and not for the child? So this dua that I just mentioned now, which is made at the time if it's a child, is all about seeking forgiveness for the parents of the child and making the child uh, something which will be inherited for them in the hereafter. So why is the dua for the parents and not for the child? 
So the obvious answer is that the child has no sin upon him. The, uh, the pen is lifted from the child. The child hasn't accumulated any sins. Therefore, dua is made for the parents of the child instead. However, if a person was to make dua for the child, then that is well and good. There's nothing which is uh, forbidden in that matter. The ulama, they say uh, that if one doesn't know these du'as or one is unable to memorize these du'as and alhamdulillah this deen is always simple and easy that if one is unable to memorize these du'as then he can say and she can say any du'a which comes to their mind as long as it has the meaning of talab al-maghfirah lil mayyid as long as it has the meaning of seeking forgiveness for the dead person so this was mentioned by many of the scholars the author he says وَيَقِفُوا بَعْدَ الرَّابِعَةِ قَلِيلًا that the Imam who is leading the Janazah after the fourth takbir, he stands for a while without saying anything and then he makes the taslim. So why does the Imam stand for a while without saying anything before he makes the taslim? The ulama, they said to separate between the takbir and the taslim and to catch breath. To separate between the takbir and the taslim, the last takbir, the fourth, and the taslim saying assalamu alaikum and in order to catch breath in order to, to say assalamu alaikum also another reason some of the ulama they mentioned they said that if the people it's the, one of the reasons for doing this uh, a small pause is so that the people at the back rows uh, in case it's a large gather, gathering uh, they have the ability to make the takbir otherwise if the imam he made it the fourth takbir and then straight away he said the taslim then the people at the back they wouldn't find time to make the fourth takbir as mentioned by Shaykh Fahd al-Mutiri Hafidhullah Ta'ala Another riwayah in the madhab held by Majd ibn Taymiyyah Majd ibn Taymiyyah is not ibn Taymiyyah Majd ibn Taymiyyah is the grandfather of Imam ibn Taymiyyah who himself was an Imam and a, a very important figure in the madhab in the Hanbali madhab So he says in another riwayah that after the fourth takbir is made that you can in fact make dua that the person doesn't have to remain silent that the person can in fact make dua if he wishes to do so and then make the taslim the author may Allah have mercy upon him he says wa yusallimu wahidatan an yaminihi that the imam after having made the fourth takbir he makes one taslim upon the right and this was narrated by many of the companions radiyallahu anhum and there was no mukhalafa there was no uh, opposition to this uh, mentioned opinion. So from who it was narrated, uh, may Allah have mercy upon them, was Ali radiallahu anhu, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, wa Jabir, wa Abi Huraira, wa Anas ibn Malik, Anas ibn Malik, wa Ibn Abi Awfa, wa Wathila ibn al -Asqa. All of these companions radiallahu anhum, they narrated that one taslim suffices, as mentioned by Ibn Qudama al-Maqdasi in his encyclopedia al-Mughni, uh, volume 2, page 366. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, That the Imam, it's mustahab, um, it's recommended that he raises his hand with every takbir. That he raises his hands with every takbir. The first raising of the hands meet with the first takbir, the opening takbir, is something which there is ijma upon. There is consensus upon this as collected by Imam Ibn Mundhir and others. Imam Ibn Mundhir and others, they collected an ijma, a consensus, that the first raising of the hands is agreed upon by all the scholars, as mentioned by Shaykh Hamad al-Hamad in his explanation. Uh, with regards to the other takbirat, raising of the hands, it is sunnah, but it's differed upon amongst the fuqaha. However, uh, for those who hold that it's sunnah, they have, for example, uh, from the evidences, the hadith which is narrated by Imam Bayhaqi and it's Isnad is Sahih, uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he said, uh, kana yarfa yadayhi. That Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to raise his hands ala kulli takbiratin min takbir al janaza. That he used to raise his hands from every takbir that would be in the janaza. And as the ulama, they said that this is an action from the companions and uh, a mukhalif and opposition to it was not known. So it's sunnah agreed upon to raise your hands in the first takbir and in the other takbirat, the remain, remaining three, it's also sunnah, but it's mukhtalif, it's differed upon by uh, the fuqaha. The author, rahimullah ta'ala, he says, وَوَاجِبُهَا The wajibat in the, um, the obligatory things 
in the Salatul Janazah, in the Janazah prayer, are as follows. However, the, a point to note here is that the author, he says, wajibuha, wajib, but rather what is meant is arkanuha, its pillars. Because Ibn Qadama, Imam Ibn Qadama mentioned in Al-Kafi that these things, they are arkan, they are pillars. Okay, And this is what the author intends, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil in his explanation. So the first of these arkan is Qiyam. The author, he says Qiyam, as mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, as the hadith which we all understood by now, where the companion Umran ibn Hussein, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Salli uh, qa'iman, pray standing, فَإِن لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ فَقَائِدًا If you cannot pray standing, then sitting down. فَإِن لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ If you cannot pray sitting down, فَعَلَى uh, جَمْ Then pray on your side. So to pray standing up is a rukun from amongst the arkan of the salah. Question to yourselves, when can the healthy person, a person is healthy, there's no need for him to sit down, but when is he allowed to sit down when praying the janazah? A healthy person, he sits down praying the janazah and his salah is still valid. In what situation can this be? The ulama, they say that if the salat al janazah has been prayed upon already, whether it be one person or more, has prayed upon this janazah and this dead person, then the next prayer which is going to be held is now a sunnah prayer because the fardul kifayah has been lifted by a person or more praying upon the dead. So in this situation, because now it's a sunnah prayer, the person is allowed to pray sitting down. They don't have to pray standing up because it's not a fard prayer. The author, he mentions, وَتَكْبِيرَاتٌ arbaun that the four takbirat are the next in the arkan, the next in the pillars of the salah. So these cannot be missed uh, in the salah because as we mentioned, they are akin, they are equivalent to the raka'at, the uh, units of the prayer. And also al-fatiha. Al-fatiha is upon the imam and the munfarid. This is something which is a rukun. However, interestingly, uh, from the imams of the Hanbali madhab, Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he didn't hold it to be wajib. وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And Salah upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is also a, uh, a rukan. It's also a pillar in the, in the Salat al-Janaza. What's a munasaba? Question to yourselves. What's a munasaba for the Salah upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم? What's a munasaba meaning? What's the appropriate, appropriateness of praying upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, in the Salah? And of course, this is before the dua for the dead person. What's the munasaba here? What's the appropriate reason for doing uh, salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So the ulama they mention that uh, many ahadith, for example, uh, Imam al bayhaqi in Shu'b al Imam, Shu'b al Iman, he collects a narration where Ali radiyallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Kullu du'a al mahjub hatta yusalli ala nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam." That every du'a it faces a barrier between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is made. So making salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is from the great etiquettes and the necessities when making dua. Uh, the author, he says, وَدَعْوَةٌ لِلْمَيِّدِ And of course, from the rukan, from the arkan, from the pillars of the salah, salatul janazah is to make uh, a sincere dua for the dead person. Even if it not be a dua which is mentioned in the sunan, it can be any dua uh, that the person says as long as it has the meaning of seeking forgiveness for the dead person. And also from the arkan, the last of them is to make the salam. To make the salam, okay, the taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, and to make it once is what is imperative in the madhab of the Hanbali scholars. Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, they said in the, uh, in the hadith, they collected the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Miftah al-salaa at tahur that the key to the prayer, to opening the prayer up, is the tahur wa tahrimuha at takbir And making everything outside of the prayer forbidden is when you make the takbir wa tahliluha at taslim And to make everything which is outside of the prayer halal once again for you is the taslim, to make the taslim. So the taslim is a rukan in the salah. It's something which is a pillar in the salah. The author he says, وَمَنْ فَاتَهُ شَيْءٌ مِنَ التَّكْبِيرِ قَضَاهُ عَلَى صِفَتِهِ That whoever misses out any of the takbirat, okay, from the prayer, then he makes them up. He makes them up upon the description of the prayer. He makes them up in the normal way that the prayer is made. 
However, the mashhur opinion in the madhab that this is nadban. So for the imam, for the imam, he has to make this takbirat. For that ma'mum, if he misses any of these takbirat, then it's mandub, it's, it's uh, uh, nadban. Okay, it's recommended that the person makes up these takbirat. But if he wishes not to do so, and he makes the slim with the imam, and he leaves after that, then that is well, as good, well and good. Um, so the author, he said, whatever is missed from the takbirat is to be made up. Why? Because in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا That which you catch with, from the salah, then pray it. And that which you miss from the salah, meaning any salah in general with the imam, then make it up. Okay? So that which is missed is to be made up, nadban. And the way that you make it up is as follows. Sifat al qada annahu yaqti awwala salatihi That the sifa, the, uh, the way, the description of making up the salah is that he makes up the beginning of the salah. So whatever he prayed with the imam was the end of the salah. Okay? So for example, لو فرضنا أنه دخل دخل في تكبيرة الثالثة مثلا فإنه يدعو للميت. For example, if the person enters with the imam at the third takbir, so here he makes the third takbir and he makes dua for the mayit. فإذا سلم الإمام كبر. And when the imam makes taslim, then the one who missed the takbirat, he goes back to the first takbir. He does that and then he makes the surah al-fatiha and in the second takbir he makes the uh, salah upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he goes ahead and he makes the taslim so whatever he prays with the imam is the end of the prayer and after the imam takes, makes taslim he goes back to the beginning of the prayer and makes up the takbirat which were missed out and of course as we said this is something which is recommended there's a mas'ala to mention here an issue to mention here which is important that the madhab they mention that in a situation where it's feared that the body is about to be raised and carried okay in the situation when the person is praying uh, the imam has finished but he's got some of the salah to make up however he can see that the body is being carried it's about to be carried away in this situation the masbuq the one who has some of the salah to make up still then he doesn't have to recite what is between the takbirat he can just say the takbir one after the other make the sleep and then follow on uh, with the imam okay as it's not allowed to do this to to complete the takbirat once the body has been carried away so if the person fears that the body is about to be carried away he can quickly complete his salah by just making the takbirs one after the other and then making the taslim as mentioned by many of the humbly scholars uh, in the madhab وقوله, and he says the author may Allah have mercy upon him وَمَنْ فَاتَتْهُ الصَّلَاةُ عَلَيْهِ صَلَّ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ إلى شهر أو صلى على قبر إلى شهر and whoever misses the salah uh, the salat al janaza can pray upon the grave it's mustahab it's recommended to pray upon the grave for the duration up till a month okay and this duration the ulama say هذا للتقريب وليس للتحديد يعني this is for تقريب meaning is that it's an estimation of a month it doesn't have to be exactly a month right 28 29 or 30 days it can be a few days more or a few days less it's for taqrib and not for tahdeed uh, so they can pray up to a month uh, if they have missed the janaza they can go to the grave of the person and they can pray for up to a month what is the evidence for this the evidence is the narration collected by imam at-tirmidhi and imam al-bayhaqi may Allah have mercy upon them and the uh, hadith is mursal sahih the hadith is uh, mursal but it's sahih as mentioned by Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman in his research uh, where uh, Ibn Musayyib, he said, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salla ala qabri um Sa'ad, uh, um Sa'ad ibn Abada, ba'd shahar. That uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed upon the qabr of uh, the mother of Sa'ad ibn Abada uh, after a month, like after a month had passed, or around the end of a month, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had prayed upon the dead, uh, the mother of this companion. So due to that, they say a month is allowed. And other evidences, of course. Uh, we have a mas'ala here. Uh, if the dead body is buried and it wasn't preyed upon, then the ulama, they say that if the body has changed, like when they open the grave and they see that the body has started to decompose, then in this situation, the body is not to be brought out. However, if the body has not changed, right, it hasn't started to decompose, 
and the body wasn't preyed upon, as we said, then this situation, the body can be brought out or must be brought out and salah will be made over it, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al-Mutiri and others. Another mas'ala that some of the ulama, they understood from the following hadith in Sahih Muslim, that only the Prophet وسلم, is the one who is allowed to pray over the grave once the person has been buried. Meaning that once the janazah has been done, then the only one that could do this salah over the grave is the Prophet وسلم, because in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna hadi al-qubur mamlu'atu dhulma ala ahliha wa inna Allah yunawwiruha lahum bi salati alayhim. The Prophet وسلم, said, Verily, these graves, they are full of darkness full of complete darkness upon its inhabitants. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lightens them and brightens them due to my salah upon them. Due to my salah upon them. Okay? So some of the ulama, they understood that this was something which was khas, specific to the Prophet sallallahu that he could pray over the grave once the funeral had been prayed. Al-jawab anhu an yuqal. But an answer to this, which is correct, inna hadha takhsis, inna ma huwa fil athar la fil fi'l. That verily this taqsis, this specifying, that which is understood by some of the ulama, is for the athar, is for the effect of the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu not in the action of the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu So the effect of the salah upon the grave, which is that the grave will be full of light after it's prayed upon, that's only for the Prophet Sallallahu However, the action of praying upon the grave is not specific to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The author, he says, and it's uh, recommended, allowed, to pray upon the one who is not present uh, with an intention. So whether the person has been prayed upon or not in the land, whether the person is old or young, or young, then the humbly scholars, they allow that with an intention that this person can be prayed upon, okay? That this person can be prayed upon. Because uh, when Najashi, uh, his death was uh, found out, uh, the Prophet وسلم, prayed upon him. So this is the evidence that the ulama of the Hanbali Madhab use. In the second opinion, a second riwayah held by Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, uh, Ibn Uthaymin, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala and others, uh, they say no, Salat al-Ghaib is not permitted aslan. It's not legislated, except in the situation where the person was not prayed upon. If the person is known that he was not prayed upon, because that was the situation of Najashi, that he was not prayed upon, uh, because he hid his Islam, then in this situation, you can make Salatul Ghaib. Okay, so that's another riwayah in the Madhab. The author, he says, وَلَا يُصَلِّي الْإِمَامُ عَلَى غَالِ عَلَى الْغَالِ that the Imam, the leader of the Muslims or the head of the community is not to pray upon the one who took from the booty okay, before it was distributed. Al-Ghal huwa man katama shay'an min al-ghanima The Ghal is the one who hid something from the war booty before it was distributed by the leader of the Muslims. Okay, So this person committed a theft uh, which is serious and he's not to be prayed upon, not because he's a kafir uh, prayer is not done upon him due to him falling into kufr. No, prayer is not done upon him min bab ta'zir, due to the fact that it's zajr, due to the fact that it's reprimanding the action itself. So the leader of the Muslims, nor his representative, nor anybody of status in the community is to pray upon the person who steals from the war booty. Okay, this is a way of reprimanding the action, so that others will learn that this is an action which is reprehensible and it's something which should not be repeated. Okay. However, the rest of the community, somebody from amongst the community, must still pray upon the dead because uh, this is fadl kifaya, right? And uh, Majd ibn Taymiyyah, he said. هذا في كل من مات على معصية ظاهرة بلا توبة. That any Muslim that dies upon a major sin, okay, and it wasn't, uh, and his sin was well known in the community, and it was known that he didn't make tawbah from it, then this ruling would also apply to him. That like the one who stole from the war booty is not preyed upon by leaders of the community as a way of reprimanding, um, then also it's done for anyone else that died upon a major sin which was uh, known in the community and it was known that he didn't make tawbah. The second person that this is done upon that the author mentions, he says, وَلَا عَلَىٰ قَاتِلِي نَفْسِهِ Nor upon the one that kills himself. This person also is not to pray to be prayed upon by the Imam or his deputy or leaders of a community. In Sahih Muslim, 
The Prophet وسلم, as narrated by Jabir ibn Sumra in Sahih Muslim radiyallahu anhu, he said, Uti an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi rajlin qatala nafsahu uh, bi mashaqis. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was brought, a person was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that killed himself with a spearhead or an arrow. فَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he knew about this, he didn't pray upon this dead person. So also a person that kills themselves, okay, suicide of any nature, then this person is also not prayed upon. Uh, the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَلَا بَعْسْ بِالصَّلَاةِ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ And there's no uh, difficulty, there's no problem with praying upon the dead person in the masjid. The reason the author mentions this because obviously there's other opinions which say that um, the person cannot be prayed in the masjid because most of the jina'is of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the majority of the narrations were, the, were that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed in a specific place outside of the masjid for the dead bodies, okay? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't pray in the masjid. However, there are a few narrations where the Prophet ﷺ prayed in the masjid and therefore the author, he said, it's permissible if it's done so. From them is the one in Sahih Muslim, narrated by our mother, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, where she said, مَا أَسْرَعَ النَّاسِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَعِيبُ مَا لَا عِلْمَ لَهُمْ بِهِ How quick the people are to look up, down upon something that they have no knowledge about. عَابُوا عَلَيْنَا أَنْ يَمُرَّ بِجَنَازَةِ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ they look down upon us for allowing a masjid to be for allowing a janazah to be prayed in the masjid. وَمَا صَلَّى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى سُحَيْلِ إِبْنِ بَيْضَاءَ إِلَّا فِي جَوْفِ الْمَسْجِدِ And it's a fact that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't pray upon this companion Suhail ibn Bayda'a except in the middle of the masjid. So it's permissible if the salah is going to be in the masjid that is permissible and allowed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. With this, we come to the end of what we need to mention, what needs to be mentioned pertaining to the, uh, the funeral prayer itself. And next week, we will look at the burial, how to bury, and issues pertaining to the burial of the dead. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. If there's anyone there that has any questions, then feel free. Wa jazakumullah khair.